to touching, okay? Um, but I'm trying to protect you because I don't want you to say, Jody, you made me sick for Christmas, all right? It's the last thing I want, all right? So turn in your Bibles to Matthew, all right? One of the easiest books of the Bible to find, and that is the book of Matthew, okay? And then I only want you to turn into two chapters. So find the Old Testament, the split between the Old and the New Testament, the very first book. Of the New Testament, you'll find the book of Matthew, and in Matthew chapter 2, I want to read to you when the men came, and they presented the gifts to Christ, okay? And so this morning, just for the next few moments, we're going to talk about the gift, the gift. Um, I always love watching Sunday night football, and on Sunday night football, they do something a little different that they don't do in all the other NFL games. And they give the uh, starters for the offense and the starters for the defense the opportunity to introduce themselves on their first play of the game. And so it'll pop up a little box on the screen and it will begin to rotate between all the offensive linemen, the defensive linemen, the backs, quarterback, uh, and they will state their name and what college that they're from. Some will even go down and give credit to their high school or elementary school, which I think is just a really neat thing that those pro players do. But one of the things that got started a few years ago um, it was when those big guys would get up and they would say, I'm so-and-so, and they would begin to say what college they're from. And some of them would put the in front of their college, the University of Kentucky, the Ohio State, the University of Florida, the Florida State. And I guess it was a play on, they wanted people to know that um, I am from here and it is the Ohio State, the Ohio State. In other words, it cannot be replicated. Well, I wanted to tell you about the gift this morning that cannot be replicated, that cannot be copied. It cannot be mimicked, and that gift is given to us in Matthew chapter 2. That gift is also given to us in Luke chapter 2, the one that we probably know and are more familiar with, but it is the story of the birth and Savior, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that during Christmas, we, we know we shower each other with gifts. That's something that we have done for a long time. And in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 11, the Bible says that that gift exchange began when Jesus was born. And a lot of people may want to try to throw off on um, the gift exchanging and say that we've gone too far, and maybe to some extent we have, but I believe the gift exchange is biblical in a sense, and here we see that in Matthew chapter 2 uh, and verse 11. Okay, so let's read. And when they come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. Turn me down just a little bit. I'm too loud this morning. And when they were coming to the house, and everybody will appreciate that, they saw the young child. Why didn't somebody say something? They saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, you can do a lot of reading about why these particular gifts were chosen by these men as they came to Christ and they presented those gifts to him. Treasures, the Bible says, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These were not just any off-the-shelf random gifts. They were specially selected because Christ was born. They realized the significance of this. And one, or maybe many writers, but one that I read this week said, the reason that myrrh was chosen is because myrrh was an embalming oil that they used and we can still buy that today you can buy that as an oil that will maybe do some good uh for your body and so uh, can you do the same with frankincense which frankincense was a sap type material that they would cut uh, a bark cut the bark of the tree and it would begin to run out and they would take that and use it uh for various purposes back uh, in the biblical times. And then, of course, we know the significance of gold and the worth that it was and still is today. I think, if I'm not mistaken, gold is more precious as far as monetary amount 
Gold is more expensive today uh, than it ever has been. In other words, the price of it or the exchange of gold is higher today than it ever has been. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I believe uh, that the price of gold is very high. But even in biblical times, maybe, I've even read where that myrrh was more precious even than the gold. But they were significant gifts. These were not just rushed to the store because you left somebody off. Or maybe somebody gave you a gift and you didn't know they were going to give you a gift and now you feel obligated to run to the store and buy them a gift. And I think we've all been in that circumstance, but there was a lady, and I read this story uh, in preparation for today that said this, that one woman, for example, waited until last minute to send out her Christmas cards. She had 49 people that she wanted to send a Christmas card to. And so she rushed into the store and she found a package of Christmas cards, a package of 50. She didn't really look at them. She was in a rush. She needed to hurry and get them in the mail so that the recipients could get them by Christmas. And so she addressed the 49 people and signed them without reading the message on the inside. On Christmas Day, when things had kind of quieted down and she was cleaning up around the house and picking up, she noticed that one card that was left over that was unsent. And finally, reading the message, she was stunned to know that the 49 people had received a card. And on the inside of the card, it had written, This card is just to say, a little gift for me is on the way. <laughs> And so suddenly she realized that 49 of her friends were expecting a gift from her. And so we all know what it means to exchange. You've received some wonderful gifts over the years. I've received some great gifts over the years. Matter of fact, I received one this morning. And I want Parker to go over, Preston, or Parker to go over and get that off my desk. It's orange and something that you can eat. And as he can go over and get I want to show you the gift that I got. I meant to go over during the time of fellowship and get that, but I left it over in the office. But somebody very special brought me a gift this morning, and I want to show you what it is. And I'm actually going to use that uh, as part of my illustration. But a gift is on the way, the card said. A gift from me is on the way. Do you know that the Old Testament said that many times to you and I? That a gift from God is on the way. What do you mean? Well, I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. That is one of the first uh, go-tos of the uh, prophetic nature of Christ coming to the earth, leaving heaven, taking on flesh, being born in a lowly manger. In Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, God spoke to Isaiah and said, write these words down and let the people know that a gift is on the way. Well, what was that gift going to be? Well, the Bible says this, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulders. He will be the ruler and reigner. That's what that meant. The government will be on his shoulder. Have you ever seen these leaders come up and they've got on this garb and on that garb is, is like something, some kind of insignia on their shoulders. And that is replicating to us or showing to us that they uh, are the leader of their government. They are the king. They are the prince because of what they have on their shoulders. The Bible says the government shall be Upon his shoulder, he will be the ruler of his government. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Another thing in the Old Testament that proves to us that God is saying to us, a gift is on its way, is in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Now, I messed up, and I, I told them to put Isaiah 28 29. I marked that out. You need to mark that out. And what needs to be there is Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. If you're quick to turn in your Bibles, you can follow right along. But write it down. Mark that out. Correct my mistake. I make them all the time, uh, and I don't care to admit that. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. 
Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. That was the card, in a sense, that God wrote to you and I in the Old Testament. And there are many times, even in the Psalms, when David was singing praises to God, he would prophesy about a child that would come to be the Savior of the world, my Savior and your Savior who would take on flesh, leave heaven, take on flesh, go to the cross, shed his innocent blood. Why would all of that happen? So that you and I could go to heaven to be with him. Now the Bible says this, even in the New Testament, the people expected the gift to come. On December the 25th, my boys will wake up and above all other things, they will have expectation. Expectation of what? Expectation that there's gifts in that living room. Oh, and if there's not gifts, somebody's going to pay. I mean, if there's not gifts on that couch, if that, if that fat guy didn't drop down our fake chimney, if he didn't drop down and come through our house and lay gifts on the couch, then somebody, somebody is going to pay the price. Because there's expectations in my house. What are those expectations? The expectation is there better be gifts on Christmas morning. And if there's not gifts on Christmas morning, when we gather here at 12 o'clock on Christmas Day to sing joy to the world, the Lord is come. When we gather and we give praise to God for sending us the ultimate gift of His Son Christ, if, there, if those expectations aren't met at the Maggard residence and my kids wake up and there's no gifts to be opened, boy, you'll be able to tell it on their face. I bet they sing joy to the world. I bet they don't sing it as loud as others. I bet they don't say there is no joy. We didn't get any gifts. But even in the New Testament, the Bible says there was an expectation that, that the gift was coming. What is it? The woman at the well. You say, boy, I'm too bad for Christ. Well, let me tell you this. This woman had been married a hundred times. Actually, she hadn't been married that many, but it was a lot. She told, she told Christ, she said, I don't have a husband. And Christ said, oh, you're right about that. You don't just have one. You've got, you've got five, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. And so Jesus goes on to speak to her, and she speaks back at Christ and says this. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah comes which is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. Even among the sinners, even among those with a record past, even among the unclean, there was an expectation that Christ was going to come, that the gift was on its way. Well, the gift came. And you can go to Luke chapter 2 and you can read all about it in detail. You can read about how there was no room in the inn and there was no room for Christ. There's still no room for Christ today. We, matter of fact, have less room for Christ in our world than we ever have had. Our leadership today has seen to it that we have less room for Christ in the White House than there's ever been in the White House. In our capital, there is less room for Christ today than there has been in the past. In our schools, there's less room for Christ than there has been in the past. And I'm going to say it, and you may not agree to it, but I believe it's the truth, that even in our churches, there's less room today for Christ than there has been in the past. And the fact of the matter is that Christ came. The Bible said He's coming. There's all kinds of Scripture. I read to you just two or three places where it said that Christ was going to come, the Messiah is going to come. You can go to Psalms, you can read about it. You can go to Isaiah, you can read about it. You can go to Daniel and you can read about it, how these men were moved by the Spirit of God. God said, write these words down. They might not have understood it completely, but they wrote the words down. And you and I now know that that was prophecy, that God was sending His Son, the unspeakable gift to the world. How do we know it? Because Christ is kind. How do you know if a prophet's right if what he says comes true? And all of these men, as they were moved upon by the Spirit, they wrote these words down that said, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming, God's Son is coming, a child will be born, a child will be born. How do we know that's true? Because Luke chapter 2 says he was born. And then Paul wrote after the fact. 
And in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 15, Paul said this, Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. I love that verse. You've heard me say that verse many times. You've probably read that verse many times. Thanks be unto God, Paul said, for his unspeakable gift. That should be what you and I are saying every day of this holiday season that we're in. And everybody is saying all kinds of things associated with the Christmas season. One thing that should be on all of our hearts is thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. The gift. Not just any gift. The gift. U.S. consumers, in the Gallup poll, we spend $57 more than we did last year. I think this was a couple years ago, maybe in 2021. More than one-third say their, their gift buying will top $1,000, one-third higher than the year before. And so we put a lot of emphasis on giving gifts. We go out and we try to find the perfect gift. And you and I, we're out here searching. We're going to do a little Christmas shopping ourselves this week for our family. So I'll need more money next Sunday. So if you could put a little extra in the offering plate, I sure would appreciate that. You know that's not how that works, but it's funny to say. Can't let the truth get in the way of a good story. And so we're going to go out. We're going to do a little Christmas shopping this week. I, I've been doing some Christmas shopping and of my own. I'm not even that far behind. Matter of fact, I've done quite a bit of it already so that it don't come upon me and I don't owe 49 people a gift. And, and so Paul said, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. And I, But I can't go out and buy a gift that pales into comparison to the gift that God has already given to me. And I can't, I can't offer you a gift that would even pale in comparison to the gift that God has already given to you. You and I have the best gift. We've received the best gift. He's already came. And he lived on this world for 30 some years. And in that time, he ministered to us. And he done all these miracles and, pr and proved to us that he was the son of God. He said he was. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And he tells us that. And so we go out and we search for gifts, and in doing so, maybe just, my friend, we forget just how valuable that the gift that we already have really is. Because this gift, let me, I only gave you two things this morning. And, and, and you can see there very simply that Christ's unspeakable gift is free and it's forever. And there's no gift that you'll receive this Christmas that will meet both of those conditions. You may receive a free gift, but it won't be a forever gift. Because whatever you receive has a limited time frame on it. Most of the things that we buy today have what's called a warranty, right? That got started a long time ago. And now, just about everything you pick up says they've got some type of warranty, some kind of proof against damage or uh, the need of repair, and, and even some have said a lifetime warranty. Well, you know that's not true. What do you mean? Well, you know they're going to kind of come up with something in the fine print that's going to say, well, how did you use it? And you say, well, here's what I did. Oh, well, what you didn't understand, that voided the warning. And, and so we know that there's not many gifts out there that's even free. Now, if you look at the gift that I got this morning, that Chase gave to me, oh, it's a great gift. Matter of fact, it's one of the best gifts. But it wasn't free. And he knocked on my door this morning, and I was in there getting ready, and he just sort of peeked in. And I, that's the first time he had ever visited me in my office, I think. Which kind of comes as a surprise to me that he's not been in my office before. But I think that's the first time he's ever been in my office. And when he came in, boy, look what he brought me. And he said, you know, and Leanne said he just wanted to stop and get you a gift. And we're a little late because of it. And my friend, you're excused for being late if you bring me a gift. And, and so he brought me a gift. And I love these things. And you can tell I love them. And, 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 but this, this wasn't free. 
just because he's a cute little fella and he walked into the store this morning. That I'm sure that the clerk at the at the register didn't say, oh, you're so cute, just take whatever you want. No, there was a cost to this. And I'd say if he would have said, I'm taking that to my pastor, Jody Magger, they'd say, oh, it's double. <laughs> But this gift wasn't free, but the gift that God gave to us in his son Christ was free. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift. It's a gift of God. Now if I have to pay for it, it's not a gift. If I have to earn it, it's not a gift. If I earn my salvation, then salvation is not a gift. Salvation is compensation for what I've earned. You go to work and you work for two weeks, you have an expectation that you're going to get paid. When the, when the boss pays you, don't let them act like it's a gift. <laughs> They're not giving you a gift. They're giving you the compensation of what you earn. And that's not the way salvation works. The Bible makes that very clear. It's not of yourself. You can't earn it. You can't outsmart it. You can't obtain it through some type of merit. You can't live long enough to deserve it. No. The Bible says it's not of yourself that salvation is a what? It's a gift of God. It's nothing like this. One, it's not free. This was not free. What God gave to us in His Son Jesus is free. It doesn't cost you anything. And by the way, if you were to pull out your wallet or your investment accounts or, or your mason jars that's full in the backyard and you go get them and you lay them at the altar, why, my friend, what is that to God? You say, well, you don't know how much I have. I don't, but I know how much God has. He's got it all. So what you would bring would be laughable. What you would earn or try to earn would be laughable. You go out here and you say, okay, I'm going to cut everybody's, I'm going to cut everybody's grass this summer in hopes that I can go to heaven. What do you think that is to God? Nothing. Your righteousness is but filthy rags. It isn't worth a dime. And so the gift of salvation is free. And not only is it free, but it distinguishes itself also because it's forever. Now, I can assure you that this gift is not forever. <laughs> how, how do I how do I know how do I know that this gift is not forever because I've already planned ahead and and when I'm going to consume it and and and, and it could very well be between the time I leave here and the time I go to my mom's to eat <laughs> this is an appetizer and, and so it's not I can promise you it's not going to last forever. I, I live in a house with three boys. Some of you have done that same thing. And I'm telling you right now, at the age they are, at the age of 14, 13, and 8, you cannot keep food anywhere. You can't hide it. They'll find it. Preston took the ACT Saturday morning. I got up about 7 o'clock Saturday morning, and I walked in. He was getting ready. It was early. He was sitting down at the, at the table, and Cassie had already fixed him something to eat. And do you know what he was eating for breakfast before the ACT on Saturday morning? Baked chicken, macaroni and cheese, and mashed potatoes. And I went in, and I looked, I looked at the plate, and I, I said, what are we doing? And I know this, if he does good on that ACT, you know what dad's eating for breakfast every morning? Chicken, macaroni, and cheese, and mashed potatoes. And if that's the answer, we've got something. But you know what? It doesn't matter. No, no food is forever in the Maggard household. And, and so, what is forever? I'll tell you what forever is. Forever is Christ. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. It's forever. You may die today, but if you've got Christ, you're going to live forever. 
Isn't that a one? That's wonderful news. That's worth you coming to church for to be able to hear that. That if you were to die today, you're going to live forever. How am I going to do that? Because the Bible says that the gift of God is eternal life. It's not separated by death. Your marriage is separated by death. Your parenting is separated by death. Your co workers is separated by death. Your relationship with your employer is separated by death. A lot of things terminate upon death. But there's one thing that will not ever terminate upon you. You leaving this world and it's the gift that God gave you why because it's eternal and eternal takes us from this life into the next life well how long is that next life forever and so the Bible says the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord and where does this gift come from the Bible says this very quickly and we close James chapter 1 and verse 17 every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and it comes down from God, who is the Father of lights. And the Bible says there is no variableness with God, and there's no shadow of turning. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't wake up tomorrow in a bad mood. It's not that God says, I made a mistake years ago, and I'll fix it today. No, no, my friend. The same God that spoke light into existence in Genesis chapter 1 is the same God that's wanting you to come and be saved this morning. And there's been no change in him. He is perfect from the beginning. He will be perfect in the end. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, and besides Him, there is no other. There is no other name given among heaven among men whereby we must be saved. And the Bible asks the question, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It's the salvation. It's the gift. All the other religions of the world serve a dead God but us. And I'm thankful that my God is alive and well. Who hears and answers prayers. The Bible says his ear is not deaf to the cries of his people. His eyes are not shut. No, no. My friend, he knows right where we are this morning. He knows the condition. He knows our needs. He knows our wants. There was a couple of prayer request cards that were given to me this morning that said, remember me, I have an unspoken request. And, and, and I've received those, and I've already looked at those. And do you know what? I may not know what those are, and it does not matter. Because when I go to God in prayer about those this week, you know what God knows? He knows every detail of that situation. I don't need to know. God already does. The greatest gift of this world came from God. How do I know? The Bible says this. In the most basic verse of Christianity, John 3, 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that He did what? He gave. God loved you enough that He gifted His Son to you. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. This brings tears to my eyes and it breaks my heart. Why? Because... I am a father of three sons, and there's no way that I would give them for any of you. You say, well, huh, I'm just telling you the truth. I would not give my sons for any of you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't kill them to save you. I just couldn't do it. They're my sons. I'm their father. I have a bond with them unlike I have a bond with anybody. I mean, Cassie is my wife. I have a bond with her unlike I have a bond with anybody. It's not that I uh, don't want to love you, and it's not that I don't care for you. No, it's not that. I do love you, and I do care for you, and I am your pastor, and God's put me here, and I want to try to do everything that I can under my power and that God has given me the talent to be able to do, to, to put you underneath of, of, of the wings of God and corral us all in and come and pull you and say, God wants to save you and do everything that I can to get you on the path to heaven. I know that I don't do it all just right, but one thing I do, my friend, I want you to go to heaven. And I do. I want you to go to heaven. And I, I'm telling you that I couldn't do for you what God did for you. God gave his only son to die for you. And you say, well, I'm not that bad. That's true. But God just didn't give his son to die for the not so bad. God gave his son to die for the worst of the worst. Those that are on death row this morning for the most heinous crimes that don't even get to see the light of day. We're talking about human beings that's so dangerous to mankind that we don't even let them see sunlight. 
But I, if I could go to that prison, if I could go to that little peephole that they get to where they can just throw them food every three times a day, if I could just get there and speak the words to those people, what would I say? What would you say? What we need to say is God gave His Son for you. God gave His Son for you. And they may not believe it. They say, I'm too bad. And in my eyes, yes, they are. Because I wouldn't give my son for them. But my friend, that we'd have to tell them the truth, that God loves you enough that he gave his son for you. That's what the Bible says. For God so loved the world. If it wasn't the world, it wouldn't say the world. If it, would only, if it was going to exclude a certain group, this would have done it. But the Bible says there is no exclusion. That for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loved you enough, he gave his son for you. How did he do that? He went to the cross. And there he died naked in his shame, carrying your sins and my sins. Why is Christmas so important, my friend? If there was no Christmas, there'd be no cross. And if there's no cross, you and I have no hope. This is the, this is the beginning of our redemption story. It's when the Bible says that Christ came and he took on flesh. And here come the wise men. And, and here, come, here come these people to see, all based on what the King, King Herod said, go see, go see for yourself. And bring back word to me. And they didn't come back because God sent them in another direction. Because Herod wanted to kill him. Right off the bat, Jesus was a wanted man. But thanks be unto God. He went to the cross. He shed his innocent blood. He died for you. He died for me. He died for the whole world. So we give the invitation here in about 30 seconds. We're going to play the song that says, I surrender all. And what does that mean? Let's put it all together. It means this, that if you're lost in your sins and you never made Christ the Lord of your life, when that music plays, you ought to run to the altar. Are you coming to the wood? Are you coming to the carpet? Are you coming to this church? No. You're coming to the Savior of the world. The Savior of the world. And you say, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Stand with us this morning all over God.